Okay, this is HIT 211 Week 1 Live Lecture. I will be your presenter. My name is Donna Francis Clark. Um, I know today is the day, or tonight is the night before the 4th of July. Also, this is the first week in the HIT 211 course, so I realize it that it was a good chance that we may not have any participants tonight. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to go ahead and go through the information for tonight. Um, I also would like to mention that I will be holding live lectures for HIT 211 every Sunday at the same time, which is 8.30 p.m. Central Time. Um, and for my particular session, section of, of HIT 211, I do post an um, announcement to, as a reminder on that Sunday that we're going to have a live lecture at 8.30 p.m. Central. Okay, so again, I'm going to go ahead, even though there's no participants, I'm going to go ahead and go through the information, and it will be recorded. It's going to be recorded every time we have live lecture. So for those who are not able to make it, you can go in under recording, under your iConnect, and enjoy the presentation. I want to start off by apologizing ahead of time. Um, for some of the loud noises that you may hear um, in the background of this recording. This will not be something that will occur all the time, but again, this is the night of the eve before 4th of July, and so there are a lot of individuals in my neighborhood who are celebrating already, and so I can hear the firecrackers, the fireworks, and stuff going off. Um, I'm not able to control that, so I just want to apologize um, if you hear those sounds in the background and know no one is getting shot or anything like that. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, we are in week one. This is our week one live lecture. Um, and I'm going to start off by providing you with some announcements. Um, some things I wanted to point out before we get into the material at hand. The first thing I would like to mention is that your ebook for this course, and I know I posted in my section of the course that the ebooks are no longer on the top tab. Um, however, you should be able to locate it under syllabus. Okay, where your books are located. And so I'm scrolling through there at this very moment. Yep. So if you go and scroll down toward the middle of your syllabus, you will see a link for your um, ebook. The ebook is your textbook for this course. Um, this is not your coding manual. So you, you do have your um, textbook and the workbook that goes with your textbook. Um, uh, when I talk during the live lecture, I refer to your um, CPT book, which is your, your uh, standard edition CPT. I refer to that as your um, coding manual. And then your 2015 step-by-step, -step, I refer to that as your coding textbook. So that's how you're going to know the difference. I know that um, a student had inquired uh, something about um, the difference between the standard edition CPT manual and I think the professional. I think she asked me about it was something to that nature. There are different versions and really what that is, um, is the major difference between those is, is the type of resources that they provide to the actual coding, the codes and the code descriptions and stuff itself. So what by that I mean certain um, certain types or certain um, editions will maybe provide color coding or some other additional notations besides your basic codes and code descriptions, code descriptions and what have you. But all of them 
will allow you to provide the code. So it won't. It's not going to be that huge of a deal. Um, because I think someone mentioned that the syllabus said one thing in the bookstore. I mean, I think the syllabus probably had the standard edition, and then in the bookstore it said professional or something. Um, so do, do not worry too much about that. So the thing you would need to worry about is if you have not purchased your coding manual, then you need to do so as soon as possible. However, um, you can also use your encoder. An encoder is provided um, in your course shell. And um, if you go under, let's see, where is it? iLab. I think that's where it is, your iLab, your 3M encoder. You can also code from that as well. That's going to be your uh, automated way of coding. So you, I suggest that you learn to do use both um, on the job. They may have your um, encoder provided for you, but what if the technology goes down? Sort of like a nurse, you know, they, they have digital thermometers, but they also learn how to use those manual glass thermometers with the or mercury or whatever that is they have in there. They learn how to use both. So you should also be able to use both. If you take a coding, some of your coding credentials that they offer, um, they are not going to allow you to use an encoder. Um, I believe with the CCA, which is through a HEMA, um, I don't think you need a coding book at all. I think they provide coding descriptions for you. But um, there are other coding exams in which, uh, credential exams in which you will have to use a coding manual and an encoder is not allowed. All right, so to access that 3M encoder, you go to your iLab portal. Um, and also, if you're looking in your syllabus, it you have um, other coding tools uh, and coding exercises provided um, under that iLab portal. All right. Now, um, some other things I want to point out to you is that every week um, under your discussion you're going you, you're going to have your um, your regular two graded threads uh, week one has that week one in your week one module <coughs> excuse me um, you have two graded threads but once we start in module two something is tickling my throat, you're going to see that one of your, um, you're going to have two graded threads and then you're going to have a thread for, that's going to give you some cases, medical record cases in which you need to code or respond to. Now what I need to point out is that in your discussions, um, the rule is if you, you've read your syllabus, and as well as the announcements that have been provided to you, that you have to have three posts. You need to have three posts in each graded thread. And these have to be substantive posts, meaning it has to provide um, some type of um, message or idea or thought to the discussion at hand. Okay? Um, and so you, you cannot just post, I agree or something to that nature, but you need to be adding something to that discussion. It could be very well be you may bring in something of personal experience. It may be something you have researched or looked up in uh, reference to the topic we're discussing. It could be something from the lectures that are, are the lessons that are provided in the modules or from your textbook itself. Um, so and these are not graded based on correct or incorrect, so everyone should be able to participate fully in your discussions. Now, the third thread, which you do not have in Module 1, when you get to Week 2 or Module 2, you're going to have basically three graded threads. So remember, you have to have three posts, substantive posts, in each graded thread. 
What that means is uh, starting week two, you're going to have your two regular threads and then your medical record cases thread. So you are going to have nine posts in all because that's three graded threads, okay? I, I just thought I would, this uh, session I would bring that out because that has been an issue for one or two students in the past. So I figured if I bring it out in the beginning, um, that may be of some help, okay? So that's nine comments and all. Your initial first comment needs to be uh, by Wednesday. Okay. Now in your medical record cases thread, again, um, the, the cases that you're going to be utilizing, there's a link there um, under that thread when you get to week two that you can click on um, to access the cases. It says the coding cases can be found here, and you can click there, uh, as well as you can find it if you go to um, the lesson tab and go to the bottom. You'll also uh, find um, the cases, all right, for you to discuss. Okay, remember no right or wrong answers, so you need to just participate, participate, participate. Okay, so let's get back to week one. Um, and in the week one um, module, um, we are covering for this week chapter one and chapter 13, okay? And again, we're in that step-by-step -step book, so we're going to do chapter one, which is uh, reimbursement, HIPAA, and compliance chapter, and chapter 13, our introduction to the CPT and level two national codes. That's what we're covering or addressing this week, um, what I um, want to mention, and which will be mentioned again, your study guide for this course that's going to be for your final exam is in your doc sharing. I'm mentioning that on the front end so that you are aware that it's there. You can utilize that to assist you in studying right from week one, uh, which will help you to be better prepared when we get closer to week eight if you're already um, sort of looking at that. So I do encourage you to go ahead and download that and start utilizing that right off the top week one. Um, that's my suggestion. Okay, the um, other thing here, you do have a homework ES that you are going to be responsible for um, by Sunday of this week. Starting week two, you're going to have a homework ES as well as a quiz assignment. All right. Um, so I think that is all I need to mention right off the top in terms of navigating and things through this course. Now, what you're going to find with the live lectures, um, I may not hit on everything um, that is going to be covered in each of your weeks. I uh, are usually going to pick out the things that's going to be most beneficial um, to you. Um, I may mention some of the others and then delve a little deeper into other things. So it just kind of um, depends, but I usually do go ahead and mention all of, all of the topics being covered and then kind of direct you into what we will be discussing specifically during the live lecture. Okay, so um, as I previously mentioned, uh, your chapter one of your textbook is, is on reimbursement, HIPAA, and compliance. Um, I'm not going to do very much in terms of that. I'm basically tonight, my thrust is going to be more or less introducing you to the CPT um, and the Hicks Picks family of coding, that coding system. So reimbursement will be something you will need to go ahead and read yourself and you can also um, take advantage of the lessons there on the lesson link under week one. Um, but under reimbursement, HIPAA and compliance, they, they um, address the Medicare program, you know, you got your part A, B, C, and D. Um, they talk about the 
quality improvement organizations and it is going to behoove you to read some of these things you these things will be reflected in the final exam um, and then it talks a little bit about HIPAA you know CPT is one of the um, coding systems approved under um, that pushed through under HIPAA it's a code a approved code set um, and so HIPAA is discussed here and the different and, and more or less HIPAA in terms of um, the um, section two of HIPAA that deals with administrative simplification um, that covers privacy, security, uh, your national, your identification, your um, your um, your the identification or ID of your different uh, entities within the in um, insurance and tr uh, claims transaction environment being like your health care providers, health plans, and so forth. Um, it talks about the Federal Register in Chapter 1. This is that publication um, that puts forth the different rules and um, um, things that the, that the agencies that help support the laws and things that come down from the Federal Legislature, these agencies that help enforce those things they, they are often published in your federal register. Um, so your book um, talks about that, and that's how we know certain things that are going on or that's going to go on. A, a big example, a prime example of that being when ICD-10 was implemented. These things showed up um, in the federal register. Okay, this is me just briefly going through um, re the reimbursement HIPAA and compliance chapter. It's a brief overview. Uh, the other thing about Medicare is the one of your largest third-party pairs are governmental pairs of insurance, and it also is usually the takes the lead, whereas other third-party pairs follow usually what Medicare does or some version of what Medicare does. Having said that, Medicare A being for your hospitalization type services, um, the the reimbursement method that's being used there in Medicare A um, is your um, PPE, your prospective payment, uh, PPS, your prospective payment systems that utilizes what we call an MSDRG, right? Uh, medical severity diagnosis related groups. Uh, that is the reimbursement method for Medicare Part A hospitalization. Again, with other insurance companies, they're going to use some um, form of that that fits the type of um, health care settings that they cover under insurance. Your Medicare Part B being for outpatient services and it falls under what we call um, the reimbursement method resource based relative uh, value scale, your RVRVS, which utilizes RVUs, relative value units. This is what is used to um, Calculate reimbursement on a outpatient basis. Okay, so it talks about that. Um, and then the final um, section here kind of covers um, compliance in Chapter 1. Um, and this is where they talk about fraud, Medicare fraud, what fraud and abuse is, um, who are the violators, what fraud looks like. Um, and um, also the um, penalties, right? The penalties. And then the final section here, which I think I said fraud was the final section, but managed health care um, is the final section. This is um, the type of um, health care delivery that dealt with the cutting or the managing of costs, right? Health insurance had gotten so high in terms of cost, um, it kind of gave birth to what we call uh, the managed care system, right? Due to all those high costs, they wanted to find a way, or those rising costs, they wanted to find a way to um, control those, to manage those, to um, make it not as costly. So um, managed care came about, um, which utilizes um, in its pure sense um, your HMO being one of your, your oldest forms of managed care organizations, the health maintenance organization 
that kind of you had like your gatekeeper who kind of controlled your access to certain types of care, and by doing that, they can control um, cost. But um, as time has gone by, we we've seen other variations or hybrids of the the um, traditional HMO, right? So you have PPOs, your preferred provider organizations. Um, that have some type of managed care, your uh, exclusive provider organizations, and, and so forth. So that is chapter one in a nutshell. However, the meat of our discussion, which is what you're going to be utilizing in this course, is going to deal with the actual coding system, right? Our coding system. What was this class? In reference to this class, this is your CPT system CPT which is the name you see on your coding manual is um, your current procedural terminology CPT current procedural terminology and um, right now um, we call this CPT fourth being your fourth version right um, and we use CPT CPT is really for outpatient Procedures, right? Outpatient services and procedures, right? What are outpatient? Like your home health. You also have departments in your hospital that are considered to be outpatient. For example, like your emergency department, your ambulatory surgery services, any lab, laboratories and stuff, that's outpatient. And then your physician office, traditional outpatient. They, they would use... Um, the CPT for procedures. So that's our patient. So inpatient just for the for facts and some of you probably have already taken it. I'm um, in a previous course. I'm not sure where it falls in your um, schedule, but if you took I C D ten PCS, right? I C D ten PCS, um that's your I C D ten procedural coding system, that's your inpatient procedures. Right? I C D ten PCS. The ICD 10 CM is for diagnosis code. So that's not procedures at all. The ICD 10 CM is for the coding of conditions, illnesses. All right. Your ICD 10 CM is going to be used across all of these healthcare settings, whether it be outpatient or inpatient, because all of them have to indicate what that patient is presenting with. What is the diagnosis? What is the condition? So regardless of the fact of whether it's inpatient or outpatient, they're all going to use ICD-10-CM. However, when we get to coding of procedures, now is where we're going to split hairs in terms of are we using ICD-10-PCS, are we using um, uh, CPT, all right? Now, you also have um, your Hicks picks. Now, CPT is actually under what we call the Hicks Picks um, system. Okay, so CPT is actually a type of um, Hicks Picks code. Okay, now um, your Hicks Picks. When we're looking at the Hicks Picks coding um, system. This system has um, two levels, okay? There's two levels to your um, Hicks Pick system. Hold on just a minute. Just a minute here. I'm looking for something. I think it was something else I want to mention before I talk about that. Uh, let me see. I think it was something. I'm not seeing it. I might have, um, let's see, did I overlook it? Oh, just a second. Where is it? I think I, I had jotted something that I want to mention here before I went into the different levels. But, maybe not. I don't see it. 
Okay, maybe it'll come to me a little later. Okay, but um, anyway, so you have two levels um, for your Hicks Peaks coding system. And as I mentioned, your CPT is actually a part of this system. It's the overall umbrella. Hicks Peaks stands for Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System. Healthcare Common Procedural Coding System. Your Hicks Peaks Level 1 code is, guess what? It's your CPT. All right? So your CPT, which stands for Current Procedural Terminology, is actually a Level 1 Hicks Picks code. Okay? Level 2, your Hicks Picks Level 2 codes, we actually call them Hicks Picks codes. So don't try to, to straighten, keep that straight in your mind. Your Level 1 Hicks Picks code is actually a CPT. So we call that CPT. We don't call it. You may hear someone say Hicks Peaks Level 1, but we call it CPT. Level, Hicks Peaks Level 2 codes, we actually call them Hicks Peaks codes. All right, so imagine that. Okay, now, so what's the difference? What is all of that about? Okay, let's take a look. We're going to start here. Now, on my um, slide, and what I failed to mention to you earlier is that um, I've uploaded the PowerPoint I'm using. It's in the files box, so you can download that um, if you would like. Okay? Now, let's look at the difference between your Hicks Picks Level 1 code, which is your CPT, and your Hicks Picks Level 2 code. Now, on my slide here, I have two codes, one up in your um, top left and one co a different code in your bottom right. All right, your code that's in the top left is actually a CPT code. So your CPT code or your Hicks Peaks Level 1 code, as you can see on the screen, includes five digits. All right. Um, so five digits, one, two, zero, one, one, is a actual CPT code. Now, when, when I look specifically at CPT, you can divide your CPT codes into categories. On the one, the category one codes, category two codes, and category three codes. Now, I bring those up. Your category one codes, I'm going to talk about in detail because because those are the codes that we're going to actually be using in this course. All right, that's your, your category one code. Those are your procedures and services that are, I'm talking about, and the code looks are, are, is in the format of 12011, which is five digits. All right, and I'm going to go into detail about category one codes. Now, your category two codes are optional codes because category one, Codes are required. Category two codes are optional. They are what we call uh, performance measurement codes, tracking codes, and they are formatted in five um, characters. But the last character, so the first four characters are digits, and the last character is a alphabet. So it's alphanumeric. So it would be like something 1201F or something like that. These are performance tracking codes. Um, you will find these in your CPT manual. Um, when we do these live lectures, always bring your CPT manual with you because sometimes I like for you to go to it and eyeball things that um, I'm speaking of. Your Category 2 codes are located after the medicine section in your coding manual. And we're going to talk a bit about these different sections um, in your Category 1 CPT codes in just a bit. But if you want to just jot down as a note, um, it's found right behind the medicine section. So as soon as we talk about the medicine section where that's located, you, you'll be able to find your Category 2 um, tracking code um, measurement performance measurement tracking codes. The category three codes are for emerging technology. 
Uh, we know medicine is a ever-changing on the cusp of new inventions um, in this field. And so sometimes what you're going to have is situations in where your main codes that you're going to be using, your Category 1 codes, um, may not keep up with emerging technology. Um, your your category um, one codes, your CPT codes are updated annually. So it just all depends on when this technology comes about. So what they do have is a category category three section of coding, which are temporary codes are, that are assigned for emerging technology. So if it's not found in your category one codes, category three codes may have something. This is also an alphanumeric format, just similar to your Category 2 codes, where it's five um, characters with your last one being an alphabet and the first four being numbers. So a letter in your last field. All right. These codes are going to be let, um, found after your Category 2 codes. Your Category 2 codes are found right after your medicine section, which is the last se section in your Category 1. Okay. Um, these temporary codes, your category three codes, um, they do not stay in this section forever. Um, if these emerging technology become mainstream, then they will be um, deleted from or removed from your category three and will move to category one codes in our annual updates. Um, and then those that do not, they end up being archived after um, five years. Okay, so that's that's your section. So, just a quick uh, review of that. So you got your Hicks Picks coding system, which is level one, level two, level one being what we call CPT, level two we call Hicks Picks. Now our CPT codes, as we um, mentioned, they um, are utilized for um, services and procedures. Okay, um, and then our Hicks Picks 2 codes, um, they also are um, used for um, certain services um, and procedures and equipment. Equipment and supplies are a major use for your um, Hicks Picks level 2 codes. Um, so it's so you ha you have like services from through your like ambulances, your ambulance services are found in your Hicks Peaks Level Two codes. Um, supplies and equipment, what I mean by those are DMEs, your durable medical equipment that would be like um, orthotics, prosthetics that they may use, wheelchairs, crutches. Those would be like DM um, DME, durable medical equipment um, is what we call it. Um, braces. Crutches, walkers, canes, um, all of those things you, you will find. Um, blood glucose monitors, those are the type of things that you will find um, in your Hicks Picks Level 2 code. Okay? So when you hear people um, in the field say Hicks Picks codes, then they're probably talking about your Level 2 codes um, because we, again, we call CPT a Level 1. Now, um, let's see if there's anything else I want to say about um, about that. Um, let's see. And maybe oh, um, now I do want to mention that. You, usually, when we're dealing with your outpatient procedure, we're going to use our CPT codes, right? Our Category 1 CPT codes. Now, there may be times uh, if, say, your CPT code does not fully describe um, any of the supplies, equipment, or something in, within that um, service, then you may also use a um, Hicks Picks Level 2 code. Um, 
You also may find that certain insurance companies, Medicare, may require you to use a HCPCS code for certain um, procedures or services instead of a CPT code. Uh, so you kind of have to um, pay attention to what's required, wherever you're working, and what the type of insurance you're using. Um, but usually your CPT is going to take precedence unless um, otherwise stated, or HCPCS may have certain um, items that are not found in your CPT codes and you will use it. And sometimes you may find um, where CPT and HCPCS has a code that can be used, but then you're going to follow um, whatever the insurance or your third party payer indicates that needs to be used for the claim to be paid. Okay? So that's how um, we, we, we're going to utilize that. All right. Let's move on. All right. I have not figured out how to to manage these slides. Okay. So we're talking about, so the bulk of our discussion is on CPT, right? Level 1 Hicks Picks, Category 1 CPT. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so let, let's look at that just a little bit here. So there are um, six major sections to your CPT. Now this is where I feel like, you know, it would probably be to your benefit to maybe pull out your um, CPT manual and and eyeball some of the things we're talking about because this is going to provide your foundation um, for you to code from your CPT manual. Okay. All right. So we got six sections. You got your evaluation and management section, your anesthesia, your surgery, radiology, your path your pathology and laboratory, and your medicine section. All right. Six major CPT sections. Okay. So let's take a look um, in how this is set up in the actual manual. Okay. These sections. Okay. So if you have your manual, you can pull it, pull it out. Um, and so what you're going to notice you open it up. I'm, I'm, I'll talk about that inside cover um, in a little bit, but um, and then they have some place of service codes. We're not going to talk about it. Let's focus a little bit more on. Let's get to those six sections. How that's set up. Okay. So if we're going to flip, you're going to see your content pages. Keep flipping through. That that'll help you get around. Um, Depending on your book, you, you may have some anatomical um, information that, that will help you to uh, interpret things that you're going to see in your coding manual. It even gives you an introduction um, into some of the symbols and your indexes and stuff. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so you might see some anatomical illustrations. right? But what I want you to flip to. Now, I have a 2015, uh, or this book, I have my CBT manual, I have a professional edition, 2016. Some people may have a standard, so my page numbers may not coincide with yours, but you're going to have, these are the basic components to your book that you're going to have, and so my page numbers may not be yours, but you can find what I'm talking about. Your first section, that first major CPT section I mentioned to you was evaluation and management. If you flip past... Um, your content page or any introductory pages, you should get to uh, a page that says Evaluation and Management E&M Service Guidelines. Um, my guidelines are green pages. Evaluation and Management, so the, on that, um, in the slide before this one that I showed you, I actually have those major CPT sections in order. All right, so your first one is your e E and M, we call that E and M, evaluation and management. We're actually going to talk a lot about E and M next week, so I'm not going to do much talking about it. But what I do want to point to your attention, mine being green, that there are guidelines, right? 
in the beginning of the evaluation and management E&M section. It's called Evaluation and Management E&M Service Guideline. This, this information is something you need to peruse to uh, because it's going to give you uh, guidance and instruction on how to use this section of codes. Now, what you're also going to notice if you flip to some of your other sections, I think your um, after that after your E and M section came your um, anesthesia. Please, please um, excuse all of the file words, but after your E and M section is your anesthesia section. Look in the front of that. If you flip right after my anesthesia guidelines, actually starts on page 54. Mine is all green pages. There are guidelines. What I'm giving, telling you here is that each of these major sections um, begin with a set of guidelines that is specific um, to that section. Now, in the very introductory pages, you're going to have some general guidelines, but there are specific guidelines to each of those major CPT sections right in the beginning of those sections in your CPT manual. So your manual in the beginning is going to go through all six of these sections. If you look past the guidelines um, to the actual white pages or the meat of any of these sections, I'm still in evaluation and management, you will notice, which I call this section the tabular, that it is formatted um, numerically. Right? It has a numerical order. Your e &M code, your first e &M code, you should see if you on right back Past your guidelines is 99201. Okay? So um, these codes, you have codes in each uh, major CPT section of your book. Um, and you also have, um, you, you have your major section and then you have uh, subsections. So it is breaking out, broken out into um, different subsections, all right? And again, what you will also notice if you flip through briefly your E&M or your evaluation and management section, um, you will notice that all of your codes start with 9-9. Now, your evaluation and management section is a little different um, than um, most of your other coding, major CPT coding sections in that your evaluation and management section represents more or less the physician's skill and expertise. Now, what you're going to probably also find out when we move into week two, that this section of codes is one of the more difficult ones out of all of your um, CPT coding sections. And you will see what I'm talking about next week. Um, in this particular section, you will notice that it's more or less divided by um, healthcare settings. So you got hospital inpatient, you got um, outpatient office, you got nursing facilities. You can see that right off if you're flipping um, through that, as well as certain types of services like critical care, newborn services, newborn care services. Again, representing skill and expertise of the doctor rather than the actual performing of. Um, a service or, or procedure. That's what it means, evaluation and management. So it, it kind of encompasses or um, pays that doctor based on their evaluation of that patient and the management of the diagnoses or conditions. Okay, so that's e and um, Then you have, of course, your uh, anesthesia. We kind of know what anesthesia is, right, using for surgery and everything. If you look at the subsections in this, um, section of coding um, is more or less divided up by anatomical areas of the body. So you got neck, you got your chest, wall, spine, pelvis, abdomen, and so forth. Okay? You can look at that. So all of these sections are divided by some other type of subsection, um, whether it be body system, anatomical areas, what have you. And you also notice that it is in a, some type of numerical order. So if you move from your, um, the other observation you can make with, with your E&M code starting with 99, you're going to notice right off that they are sort of out of order. They really probably, if we were going to just go strictly by um, numerical order, they should be toward the back of the manual. 
However, your E&M is in the front. Again, they're a lot different than the other sectional coding, which may be the rationale behind that. But if you notice with your anesthesia, once you get past your guidelines, that most of these codes, the majority of these codes, start with um, zero, 00. Okay? And if you go past anesthesia, you're going to get to the largest section, CP section, CPT section in the manual, which is your surgery section. And it go, literally goes through each body system. And now we're really getting into the meat of the different procedures that um, your, the providers offer to um, the patients, right? So, and it begins on the surgery. Of course, you see the guidelines, but the first system will be in your integumentary system. Um, you flip through, you also see musculoskeletal, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, so forth. And again, if you flip through, surgery is very big. Um, and if you look as well, your integumentary codes, they start with one, right? And then if I move to um, musculoskeletal, they start with two, okay? If you flip through, eyeball that. You don't, you don't take my word for it. Eyeball it. So respiratory starts with three. And for the most part, there will be some exceptions to the rule, um, you almost can determine or identify what system that you're coding from based on what that code starts with, if that makes sense. So how can that be helpful for you? Maybe you are um, taking a test or maybe you are doing some practice problems in your workbook and uh, we may be in um, the respiratory system section, maybe that's what we're addressing. And so you go through and you're going to code. And for some reason, you come out with a code that starts with seven. Um, that is, can already be a red flag for you that um, that's not the correct code. If I'm in the respiratory system, I'm more or less going to expect to come up with a code that begins with three. All right, so that can help you in terms of narrowing down. Um, what the correct code is. Now, um, it was something else I was going to say. Seven actually is your radiology um, section, and there are times when you may need to utilize a radiology code in some of your other sections because sometimes they use guidance, some type of fluoroscopic guidance or something in, to, in procedures. If that's not already inclusive in your code description, then you may need to pull a code from the seven series of codes which represent radiology codes. Well, not always the case, but more or less, um, it can help guide you into correctly coding um, some documentation. Okay, just some, just a little tip. All right, I usually call these um, with your new numbers. I call these um, the tabular. That I, I'm not sure if we still use that. That's the PC term at this point, but that's what we always um, called it. The other thing um, here, so we talked about guidelines. So you got guidelines for overall and specific sections, right? Um, so we, I told you there are some general guidelines in the front of the book near in the introductory pages. You got your specific guidelines in your green pages in front of each major CPT section. You also have guidelines that are found in the different notations that sandwich the codes and code descriptions. Um, so, let's see. For instance, I happen to already be in surgery because that was one of the last ones we talked about, the surgery section being the largest CPT section in the coding manual. And I'm on your first code in your surgery section beginning with 10021. Um, and then if you drop that under your general, and into, under integumentary, you got skin, subcutaneous, and accessory structures. That begins with code 10030. If you look on this one page alone, mine is on page 71, but again, I got the professional coding manual on 2016. There are notations that surround all of the codes. Let me pick one out, for example. For example, code 10022. If you look under that actual code, you'll see notation that says for placement of per percutaneous localization devices, for example, a clip, a tablet pellet, 
during bread box C, C codes 19081 through 19086. These are also guidelines and things that are going to assist you uh, when you're coding. So when you are looking up these codes, you always want to read the different notations and notes that you find around that code because it's giving you information to direct you in the way to properly code um, your medical documentation. So you do not ignore these. It's very important. Okay, so you got guidelines pretty much everywhere in your coding manual. It's always good to be able to navigate um, your coding manual and know what you have in here in terms of resources and tools so that you can always code um, at the highest uh, possible accuracy. Okay? All right, tablet. Now, if you would still overall looking at the overall structure of um, this book, this CPT manual. So we're going to flip path. You're going to see um, after your big old surgery section and all the body systems within. Uh, let's see. Let me get past. The next section is your radiology. Right? So after you come out of surgery, and again, my um, book has color tips on my pages, which is helpful in me um, locating sections quickly. Depending on what coding manual you have, yours may not be color coded, but my uh, tips of my pages um, are red and green uh, and blue and so forth, and they are associated with the different sections that, that allows me to flip to them quickly. Um, so I was telling you your radiology codes begin with seven, so if you flip past your surgery section, um, I get to my radiology section, and you'll see the seven series of codes. You see your guidelines and what have you. Um, after radiology comes pathology and laboratory. Mine have blue tips on it, um, which you will observe just right off the top that these codes for the majority of the time begin with eight. All right. Um, and right after pathology and laboratory, um, you have medicine. Right. Your medicine has medicine guidelines. Um, you see that these codes begin with nine, not nine nine, but nine. Yeah, I think there may be maybe five codes in the medicine section that begin with nine nine, like your E and M codes. There may be a couple, not very many. So, like I said, there are one or two exceptions, but for the majority of them, they follow the pattern. Yeah, there are one, a couple of 99 codes um, under the miscellaneous services under your medicine section, but we'll talk about that when we get to that week. Now, after the medicine section comes your category two codes that I talked about uh, with you a little earlier, and I told you the category two codes came after your medicine section. Now you know what I mean by medicine section. So if you flip past that, my, my category two codes have a red, red tip on their page. And mine begins in, on page 667. Um, yours may be not on that page. Um, if you flip through your category two codes, you will see the alphanumeric format of the codes, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and after your category two codes, you, you will see your category three codes. Just lay your eyes on them. Um, you don't really have to do anything with them, and you're going to also see that those are alphanumeric, just as I said, as well. Now, when you flip past your Category 3 codes, um, you have your appendices. All right? They follow the Category 3 codes. Um, and I, I think that certain coding manuals do not have... The appendices in them, I don't know if it was this or your Hicksic manual. There's so many versions, but you should you should have your appendix. It starts with appendix A, uh, which gives you a list of all your modifiers that are applicable to your CPT codes, and they also can be used uh, with your Hicksic codes. Um, and then uh, appendix B are, is a summary of additions, deletions, and revisions. What that is talking about is, you know, your book, I was mentioning to you, the CPT manual is updated annually. 
and so they make changes with each edition. That's why, um, and a lot of that has to do with all the new technologies and the changes that uh, occurs in medicine on a regular basis, as well as probably some money making there, of course. But um, either way, it's updated annually. There's changes, and this also is why you have to um, get a new book every year. And, and it, as a coder, if that's your profession, usually your your employer is going to provide you um, with a new coding manual. You, this usually is not something that will come out your pocket. Um, this is going to be necessary because with those changes, um, if you're still coding from older editions, you may be submitting um, plant codes that are no are no longer correct, and this can result in denial of claims. So you have to always stay up to date with your coding manual. So um, with Appendix B, you are actually, when you get your new manual, you can go back to Appendix B, and it's going to summarize any of those changes. All right? So that's what that is. Um, Appendix C are uh, clinical examples. These are utilized with your E&M coding. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what that's all about um, in week two. Um, and then you have Appendix D, which are a summary of your add-on codes. I'm going to talk to you about add-on codes. And so it's a whole list of codes. I'm going to talk to you about that a little later. Um, Appendix G, moderate conscious sedation codes. Appendix L, vascular families. These could be helpful, especially um, in your cardiovascular coding, where it it um, is affected by what vascular family that procedure is being performed in. So that will be helpful because it kind of lays out. And I know in, if you've taken anatomy and physiology and and they go over your your veins and arteries and those type of systems. That thing can get kind of complicated because we have so many. So that may prove to be helpful, um, and so forth. So you can look through those appendices. I'm not going to go through each and every one, but there is extra information there to assist you uh, with proper coding. Now, once you flip to the last one, my last appendix is Appendix O, and after that. You're going to see something mine on page 773 from my book, again, 2016 Professional Edition, um, page 773, is what we call our index. And if you're looking on my screen, it says alphabetical index. All right, so uh, with the index, it's set up a little different from the tabular. The tabular is all those six sections that are in numerical code order. Okay, and it provides coding descriptions with each of your codes. I call that the tabular section. Um, this is your alphabetical index that's in the very back. And it, one thing you probably would observe right off is that this is in alphabetical order. You see some um, bolded terms. We call these your main terms or your key terms. They are in alphabetical order. It probably reminds you something of um, like a... Um, A dictionary, um, you see um, black terms in each corner of each page. This kind of directs you um, in what um, what um, alphabetical sequence your terms are in. Uh, for example, if I got a hepatectomy um, on my top left of the page and then I got a hernia on the top right, all of my main terms or medical terms that fall between in alphabetical order between those two terms will be found on that particular page. All right, so it was, again, just like a dictionary or some of those old-fashioned uh, phone books, if any of you are, all, are old enough to know what that is. I don't even think they have a pass out um, any of those old telephone books, but it was set up similar to your dictionary. So. That's what your index is. It's a listing of those main terms. Now, those main terms, where we get those from is from our documentation. Okay? I'm on to a new screen. Let me see if I can. Here we go. So you got in the front of your coding manual, you have codes in numerical order. Um, in the back, you, you got your index, which is in 
uh, alphabetical order of some medical terms. And um, in a minute, I'm going to tie that all together in terms of how we're going to utilize um, this to find a code. All right, but we're going to hold off on that just a second. We almost through uh, with this presentation, but we're going to take a look at what I have up on the screen at the current moment. And uh, we're going to look at these things that I have. Now, we're right at this very moment, we are in our index. And so, what I want to direct you on to the screen, which I'm going to start with this since we are in the index, if you look at your top right hand corner. Now, and, and if both of you have taken the ICD coding, it's pretty much in terms of how you're going to code and, and things like that is somewhat similar. But um, if we're in our index and we're looking at that top right hand corner, you're going to see um, what this is describing to you is what you're going to see in your index. So when you look up these particular main terms or these key terms in the index, you can take a, whatever page you happen to be on in your index. If you just look at a couple of those main terms, you're going to notice that under those main terms are subterms that are referring to the main term. And beside those subterms, you see codes, right? Now, what you see in the top right right hand corner of my screen gives you several ways you may see your codes are listed next to those sub terms. Okay? So I'm if you're looking at any page, looking at your main term, looking at the sub term, looking at the codes that are sitting next to those sub terms, you may see um, a sub term that has next to it one code, just a single code. For instance, I'm looking at um, heavy metal, which is my key term. One of my subterms under heavy metal is screen, S-C-R-E-E-N. And next to the subterm screen, screen, I see the code 83015. That's the only code. So that is an example of a single code. Now, let me look somewhere else. For example, I am now under hematoma. That's my key term. My subterm on the hematoma that I'm looking at is chest. Um, chest, incision, and drainage. Okay, and next to that subterm, I see code 21501, 61154. This is an example of multiple codes. So we saw a single code, we saw a multiple code. Um, and if I look under hematoma still and I go to hematoma um, brain drainage via burr hole, I see 61154 through 61156. So basically a little hyphen. That's a range of codes. So the this type of example is uh, illustrated in the top right hand corner of the screen. I, I give you an example of a single code, multiple code, range of codes. This is the way um, you will see codes listed within your index. Again, your index is in alphabetical order um, of your main term or your key term. And then you have subterms under the main term or key term. And next to those subterms, you have codes listed, and they can be in the format of a single code, a multiple multiple codes, or a range of codes. Okay. Now, so that's your index. Now, let, what we're going to do for just a moment is we're going to flip back and let's look at any uh, particular section of our tabular. And what I'm going to, let's see where I'm going to land. The code I'm showing in um, the top left um, corner, I have um, two codes listed there, a 26010 and a 26011. And... Um, if you look at those codes, you're going to already know 
um, based on the fact that those codes began with two, that we are in the musculoskeletal system. So those codes begin with two. And if we look at the 26010, 26011, this is a very common, a common uh, format to see your codes and code descriptions in. Okay, so um, let's look at this. 26010, your code description says drainage of finger abscess sample. So that's what that code represents. So you got your code and you got uh, your code description. Okay, now what I want you to notice um, here. Is that um, 26011, which is the next code, sequential code after 26010? What you can observe here is that the code description is indented. Okay, that's one thing, right? Um, and it's indented under your code description for 26010. 26010, right. Okay, so you see that. Now, also what I want you to um, observe is, let's look back at 26010, and we're going to look at um, the code description itself, and I want you to notice that it has a semicolon in the code description. Okay. Now, that 26010, they, they, it, there are different terminologies um, they um, use for that. Um, you have, before that semicolon, you have the drainage of finger abscess. This is what we uh, will call that 26010, the parent code, um, that drainage of the finger abscess, the, the um, phrase before the semicolon. Sometimes we call it the common portion. And this is why. When I get ready to read code 26011, which has an indented um, description, the way you read 26011 is drainage of finger abscess complicated. For example, felon. Okay? So what I just did there was to utilize the phrase in 26010 before the semicolon, hint, quote unquote the common portion of the parent and I um, so I read that and but I didn't say simple I said complicated so what I am saying to you here when we have an indented code um, we're going to what that is telling you is that there is a parent code or a common portion in one of your codes above the indented code. Now I'm saying one of your codes in this particular example is the code right above it. But sometimes you can have two or three indented type codes and your parent code or that common portion may be several codes above it. It's going to be the first one you get to that, um, is your, that has that semicolon and that's not indented. Okay. And so, when we're using that indented code, right, we're going to read that common portion in the parent code, and we're going to replace what comes after that semicolon with what is listed in the procedure code that is indented. Okay? So, 26011, you read it as drainage of finger abscess complicated. Okay, so in actuality, that semicolon is a very important symbol in our CPT system. And it actually saves a lot of space um, in, when, they, in which, when they do it this way, right? So you're not writing um, all of that over again, okay? All right. Let's see what else. All right, now with the um, 
If we look at the one in the bottom right corner, we see something similar to what we saw in the top left corner, right? So we see 11000 and then we see 11001. Um, we see that 11001 is indented. And we see that 11000 contains the semicolon. So uh, we pretty much um, discussed how that should be read, right? So we, we have that there. Now, um, there's one thing that um, I'm sure you have observed um, that is a, a bit different than the code example that we utilize in the top left corner. And that, you, what you should notice is that, that um, 11001 has a plus sign beside that code. Okay, and that means something. This is a um, different symbol um, which we call, uh, so we will call that 11001, we call that a add-on code. Alright, an uh, add-on code. That plus sign, like you add um, a couple of numbers together, this is an uh, add-on code, which means um, that this code needs to be paired with a, another code. This code cannot be utilized by itself, but it has to be paired with another code. And so in our this particular example, 11001 has to be utilized in conjunction with 11000. Now if you look at the code description for these two codes, it kind of will make sense. So 11000 says the bribing of extensive eczematous or infected skin and after the semicolon it says up to 10% of body surface. Now notice what your indented code, your 11001 says, each additional 10% of the body surface are part thereof. List separately in addition to code for primary procedure. See that is a guideline note there. Okay, so just by reading that, you will first have to code for the up to 10% of body surface located in 11000 to even begin to use code 11001 which says each additional 10% meaning after that first 10% each additional 10% will be indicated by this add-on code. Hence this add-on code 11001 needs to be paired with 11000. Okay. That is called an add-on code. Now, if you recall earlier in the discussion, when we were looking at the appendix, appendices, appendix 6, I mean not appendix 6, appendix D, I'm sorry, was a summary of add-on codes. So you can go to appendix D, and it just lists every code um, in the CPT manual that is an add-on code. Okay? Alright, I told you I was going to come back to that when I, I talked about it. Now, you, there are also other symbols that you may um, see in your um, CPT book. If you look at the very bottom of your tabular pages, you will see a key, a symbol key at the very bottom that uh, identifies what, some, what these symbols you uh, see. Uh, for example, there is a um, shaded triangle that's standing with the point side up. That indicates that this code has been revised. You have the red dot, which is a new code. This is what mine. I have the um, inward facing triangles landing on the side, meaning new or revised text. Um, you got the plus sign down there, add on code. You have a pound symbol, which means resequence. And what I want to say to you about that is that um, that resequencing. So sometimes what happens, you are looking up a particular code, and you get to that section, and um, 
it's not located because we just talked about the codes being numerical order. There are times in which certain codes have been resequenced, meaning placed out of order. Um, the rationale behind that is is that wherever they have resequenced that code to, it fits better um, in that section of coding based on the type of procedures family that's there. To me, in my humble opinion, it makes it harder. Even if it's out of order, I'd rather the codes be in numerical order because it sort of throws you off. But I, I, I like to go ahead and make sure I um, address this because I'm pretty sure you're going to come across it at some point so that you're not alarmed and you realize that from time to time some of these codes are resequenced or put placed out of order on purpose. It's not a um, mistake. Okay. I feel like it makes it harder, but hey, it is what it is. Okay. I, I'm not on the uh, CPT committee board on how we need to set this up. Okay. So it is what it is. All right. The other thing here in the bottom. Um, bottom left corner. The bottom left corner. Um, this is this is what we call modifiers. All right. Now you have modifiers that can be utilized with your CPT codes as well as Hicks fix codes. You got CPT modifiers. You got Hicks fix Hicks fix modifiers. They can be used with a CPT code as well as a Hicks fix code. CPT modifiers can be used with Hicks fix modifiers. Hicks fix modifiers can be used with CPT modifiers. Um, you can use both types of modifiers on one code. You can have more than one modifier per code. Um, and but basically, the way we're going we utilize modifiers, they they help to clarify the different services and procedures that are performed by the um, doctor. Okay, so you're gonna find a code that identifies that service. You may need to utilize modifiers to clarify whatever those services are. They do not change the meaning of the code. They clarify. All right. So it's not changing anything. It clarifies. Okay. Um, and you got different types of modifiers. There is um, some some guidelines on. Um, how you need to sequence modifiers behind the codes because in actuality you have certain modifiers are uh, like informational modifiers whereas you got other modifiers which we we call pricing modifiers that affects um, the the uh, amount of money that you are going to receive on a code we call those pricing modifiers those are usually usually listed first and then the informational modifiers are usually listed after your pricing modifier. You also have certain modifiers that are only used with certain codes. Okay, you need to. Uh, I'm not going to go through each and every one of those, but you can um, utilize your textbook um, to go over those. I also um, and your modifiers in terms of format. Your CPT modifiers are two digits. Whereas your Hicks fix modifiers are alphanumeric. They're two they're two characters, but they are alphanumeric or sometimes they are two alphabets. That's how you can usually um, tell the difference between them. Okay. Now in terms of your coding manual, I just want to point out a couple of things in terms of modifiers. I told you I was gonna come back to that inside cover of your coding manual. There is like a little cheat sheet there that you can utilize it that lists um, a lot of your modifiers. Uh, so like you have modifier 22, which is increased procedural services. Uh, modifier 51 is um, a very popular one for multiple procedures. Modifier 50 is another very common and popular one for bilateral procedures. So uh, for example, if you got body parts that have two sides like your ears, your knees, things like that. Um, if, if the doctor is performing procedure on both of those sides and say 
um, the code description only covers one side, then you can uh, append modifier 50 to your code um, for a bilateral procedure. The way the coding format for your modifiers looks, um, say if we're going to put a modifier, apply a modifier onto our CPT code. Let's see. I'm going to type it in the box. One, two, three, four, five. Um, and it's going to look like this. All right, the X's. Look down in the chat box. Those X's represent your five. The first five X's represents your CPT code. Then you're going to use a hyphen. And then you use the other last two X's after the hyphen represents your modifier. So that's how um, you will write it. You also see that they show some level two hit fix um, modifiers that are either um, both alph they're alphabetical or alphanumeric. You can see some of those there. That's not an, an exhaustive list of your Hicks fix modifiers, but there are some there. Also, those symbols I was telling you about that was at the bottom of your tablet pages, they are also on your cheat sheet at the top, in the top right column. Okay, there, there's a listing of that there. But in terms of, of modifiers, I also want to point to in your appendix, the appendix A that we started with, if you flip back to appendix A, um, it also lists those same modifiers that's in the inside cover, but it provides an explanation to each of those modifiers. So it gives you a little more information, not just the modifier itself. That's appendix A uh, modifiers, as well as in your textbook, it covers that information as well. Okay, that's modifier. Now, to finish this up, how to find a code. Again, if you've taken ICD-10, um, your courses in that is pretty much similar. You um, are going to start with your index, which is what was in the back of the book that's in uh, medical uh, alphabetical order by your main term, key terms. You're going to um, take your medical record or your document, your medical documentation that's been provided to you in your problem, you're going to find the key terms um, in which to look up the, um, in your index and find the code. Key terms, your key terms will be, um, there are certain things um, that you will look uh, for. For example, your, your, the best practice is to start with um, the procedure itself. So, say if that physician is doing an excision, um, an incision and drainage, uh, a repair, those are typical examples of um, what you may see in your medical documentation in terms of the actual um, procedure that's being performed. You would um, look that key term up in the index, which is in um, which is in alphabetical order, and then you're going to find the subterm that's going to be the most specific to what you have found in your medical documentation, and then that takes us right back to um, the codes that are listed beside um, those subterms. Okay. Um, and so, once you locate the one that you feel is the most closely associated with your, with what your medical documentation provides, you're going to take those codes, whether it be a single code or a series of codes or a range of codes, and you're going to look those up and verify them in the tabular. The tabular is the section of codes that are, are in numerical order, right? Once you get to that tablet, you're going to look at those code descriptions to further verify whether you indeed have the correct code that is applicable to your documentation. Okay? And so this is how you're going to do all of your coding. You're going to look it up in the index, figure out uh, what code they list there in the index, and then you're going to take those codes and verify in the tablet, that area of codes that are, is in numerical order. So your best practice is to look up in terms of a key term, you're going to start with the procedure. That's always usually your best bet. If you're being timed on a time test, procedure is the first one you should probably try. 
but you can also say for instance in those times when the if you can't find it via the procedure you may look up in terms of an anatomical site or a, a condition sometimes it may be a synonym or a maybe you have the formal term or the not so formal term um, you may need to figure out what that a synonym of that term is and you may find it there um, you got eponyms, meaning um, you got different procedures named after people uh, that you can look it up, or maybe it's listed under. There are a lot of medical terms that have abbreviations. Um, these are the different options in terms of looking up key terms in the index. But once you narrow down, the best way to find um, where you need to be, then you look through those subterms to see which one is. The most applicable, look at what codes that they have there, and then you verify your tablet. Okay? That's how you code for CBT in a nutshell. Okay? Now, that is the extent of my live lecture for this evening. I hope that this provides you with um, a pretty decent foundation in terms of getting started encoding in this course. Now this is going to take practice, practice, practice. This is not something that may come to you overnight. So what I suggest that you do is to um, really go through and use that workbook and, and some of the problems, practice exercises in your um, textbook and not just rely on what I've mentioned to you in this live lecture, what you may read from your fellow classmates or what you may read in the lessons provided in the modules, the coding thing usually sticks best the more you practice, practice, practice. There are not if there is not a way for any coding instructor to um, touch on every example that you may come across. The best thing to do is to become super familiar with your guidelines uh, and rules for coding general guidelines as well as specific guidelines, making sure you pay attention to all notations around your codes, and that is what's going to assist you. So once you um, really put that base down, then that's going to help you through just about any coding context situation that you come across. And that also highlights the more coding practice that you do, the more of those practice problems that you do, um, the more exposed that you will become or come across different scenarios, right? And you'll be more skilled. So I just encourage you, highly encourage you to um, practice, practice, practice. Um, and this is going to signal the conclusion of my live lecture. We're going to meet here, same place, um, same time next week, next Sunday, next Sunday being, um, let's see, the 10th, okay, 8.30 Central Time, all right, again, the, um, my PowerPoint that you saw as I spoke is in the file box, so you can download that and keep it and save it for um, your reading and review pleasure. All right, um, I bid all of you good night, and again, I hope you enjoy the presentation for this evening.